بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله حمد الشاكرين الحمد لله حمد الذاكرين الحمد لله على نعمه كلها ما علمنا منها وما لم نعلم عدد جميع خلائقه كلهم ما علمنا منهم وما لم نعلم والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان الأزهران الأنوران الأزكيان الأطيبان على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I have chosen this subject today on laziness because it is a disease that affects many people, and I receive a lot of complaints, and uh, people come to us asking and seeking remedy for this disease. It's a state that could be described as uh, an epidemic, almost affecting young people across the Islamic world. So we need to see how we look at it in Islam to define the problem and its various aspects and the results exactly as a doctor diagnoses the illness and its symptoms and what causes it and then looks for the remedy. Laziness is a disease that could be described as lack of ability to do something, lack of motive to do something. I'm talking here about the disease, not the symptoms. The symptoms not doing, missing something. I'm talking here about the disease itself, lack of motive to do something which turns people into a state of relaxation, indifference and negligence to their duties. Regardless of the aspect, deen or dunya, I'm talking here in principle, because we will see that uh, laziness is a disease that affects both aspects of our life, deen and dunya. When there is no aspiration, People tend to sit and get relaxed too much and look for nothing to do other than wasting time, as they, kill it, as they call it, killing time. They get bored. This is one of the symptoms of laziness. They get tired. And subsequently, they neglect important duties. <coughs> so where does it come from? Where does it come from? This laziness, kasar. There is, of course, a principle or some points which causes this laziness. As we understand in medicine, when you see a disease, you should look at what causes it and treat it. When you treat the symptoms, you're not going to get rid of the disease. And the same also in our spiritual life. If you're suffering, if you miss prayer and you're suffering from this, you need to look at the disease which causes you missing prayer. It may be not fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enough. It may be attachment to the dunya, for example, when uh, you are involved in a certain act of sin, such as lying, you need to see what causes it, veil from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, darkness in the heart, lack of the company of the righteous people. So the same also with laziness, 
we need to look at what causes this. Laziness is not only an act. Actually, it is, it is the, not an act. It is not to do anything. Laziness is leaving all actions and not doing anything. Laziness is an attitude. It is uh, a character. It stems from not believing in the actual means of this life and having much hopes and reliance on what Allah has. We see here that a believer has to have a balance between fear and hope, or hope and fear. This is very important. Too much hopes in Allah will tempt you into clinging to this world and its temptations. Too much fear of Allah might lead you to despair from His mercy, and might lead you either to neglect to neglect the dunya or to neglect ribada altogether because of uh, being in a state of despair. So we have to have a balance between fear from Allah and hope in Him. This balance produces uh, trust in Him while taking the actual measures He ordered you to do. For example, the major challenge in our life is rizq. Everyone is worried about this, and we struggle for this from the moment we graduate from schools. We get worried about it actually before that, and we still struggle for it till the end of our lives. Rizq. A lot of people choose tawakkul, reliance on Allah, and misunderstand it and mispractice it by saying that, well, Allah guaranteed our rizq, why should I do anything about it? Here laziness comes in as a result of this wrong understanding of tawakkul, trust in Allah. Allah wanted you to trust that He has rizq for you, but He didn't want you to sit at home and expect your rizq to be coming at the doorstep of your home. Allah wanted you to go and seek. Walk on the various sides of this earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, one disciple of a shaykh misunderstood the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sat at home and left his job and left business. And when his shaykh asked him, why are you doing this? He said, the Prophet وسلم, says, لو توكلتم على الله حق التوكل لرزقكم كما يرزق الطير تردو خماصة وتروح بطانة. If you had real tawakkul on Allah, Allah would have given you rizq as he gives to birds. They go in the morning hungry, they return in the afternoon full. He quoted the hadith. His shaykh said to him, <coughs> refuting his understanding. But the Prophet confirmed that the birds go in the morning seeking their result and come back in the evening. For <coughs> they don't sit in their nests. They go looking for the result. So a lot of people misunderstand the principle of tawakkul. In Arabic, we derived, or Arab scholars in the past, derived another word from the same root called tawakul. Tawakul is reliance. Tawakul is negligence. Or blind reliance, you could say. There's no one single word in English that could fit in translation of this word. Tawakul is wrong reliance. Is uh, leaving all measures and causes and ways Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened for you. Allah guaranteed you rizq but asked you to struggle. <coughs> now since the knowledge of the unseen is hidden from us, as we explained last year in our Aqeedah classes, and you understood this very well, I hope, 
the knowledge of the unseen for a great wisdom from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is hidden from us to compete in this life. So we don't know what type of rizq and what amount of rizq is hidden for us. It looks like according to our struggle, we get. In as much as we struggle, we earn. It looks like this. Allah wanted it to look like this in order for us to make more efforts. Now the wisdom behind our efforts is that it looks to people that well, you make more efforts, you earn more money. Exactly as at work, you work extra hours, they will pay you more. You get certification more than what you're entitled to get, they will deduct from your salary. But this is uh, in front of us. In reality, rizq has been determined, predetermined from, uh, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from pre-eternity. It is for us to compete and to earn rewards for more work. A lot of people work more, but they don't earn more money. But indeed, they earn a lot more rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now money suffices in this world. The currency of money cannot be exchanged in a Jannah, in the Akhirah. It doesn't work there. But the rewards you earn for your work is a currency that is hard and can be used and exchanged in the hereafter and in Jannah. It can get you to the highest ranks in Al Jannah, although you didn't get what you wanted here, high salary or save enough to buy a home or whatever you wanted to get here. This is one of great wisdom in uh, struggling, in us struggling and not knowing what we're going to get. This is why we shouldn't be lazy. People who are lazy are not doing tawakkul at all. Tawakkul is why you proceed in this life you do not rely on the actual means, but you rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now your job, do you think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do you think that your job provides you or Allah? Allah provides you. Now when there is a conflict between any instructions, any divine injunctions and your job, you leave your job for the sake of Allah, because Allah is the provider, not the boss at your work. This is the benefit of tawakkul. Tawakkul is أَن تَكُونَ بِمَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَوْثَقَ مِنْكَ بِمَا فِي يَدِكَ To rely on Allah more than, what, more than relying on what you have in your hand. This is why real people in tawakkul would leave anything for the sake of Allah without a moment of hesitance. Here we understand where laziness comes from. Lack of tawakkul or misunderstanding of tawakkul. Now another reason or causes of, uh, of uh, another cause of uh, laziness. Lack of a goal. Lack of a goal. What is your goal in this life? Have you set your goal? You will be great or as great as your goal is. And you can succeed in this life as much as you struggle for the goal you set for yourself. Have we asked ourselves what is our goal in this life? Some people might be very practical. They'll tell you, my goal is to finish my school, get a good job, get married, and save enough money to buy a home, and he's working for it. Hard. Enough. You won't waste time. You, you call him for a football game, he'll tell you I don't have time, I have to study. You call him for a vacation, he'll tell you no, I have to take care of, uh, uh, of uh, my family, he'll tell you. Well, they are working for that goal. And in a number of years, you'll see them finishing studies or you'll see them. Uh, promoted in their jobs, or you see them saving enough money to buy a home, or you see them. It's good. It's good to have a goal in your life. Now, in Deen and Dunya, we have to have in Deen and Dunya. And Islam doesn't ban you from having a goal in your Dunya. 
a group of people came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and they described the man in their tribe who devoted his life to worship. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked them who supports him. They said all of us. He said all of you are better than him. All of you are better than him. So Islam doesn't ban you from getting uh, involved in the dunya. Islam warns you not to get concerned about it. Islam doesn't want you to get distracted by it. Take as much as you need or as much as you wish even. Because luxury is not forbidden in Islam. On condition that it doesn't distract you from Allah. On condition that it doesn't become an obstacle in front of you to take you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why it is important to understand that uh, you have to have a goal. And a Muslim usually have both. Deen and dunya summed up in one word. What do you want? I want Allah. When you want Allah, then you get everything. As Imam Ibn Atallah al-Sakandari rahimahullah ta'ala says in his invocations, إِلَهِ مَاذَا فَقَدَ مَنْ وَجَدَكْ وَمَاذَا وَجَدَ مَنْ فَقَدَكْ O oh my Lord, he who has found you, what else has he lost? O oh my Lord, he who has lost you, what else has he found? You find Allah, you find everything. All what you want, deen and dunya, all pleasures of this life. Say, I want Allah, because Allah orders you to get married. Allah orders you, it is part of the instructions of the Sharia, to get married to a young girl where you protect your chastity. To eat well and keep informed, Islam orders you to eat well and keep informed. To have a home, for example, you say, I want to have a large home. If your intention is to have a large home for your children, that they can swim with a swimming pool, they don't go to a swimming pool outside, or for, to have parties and uh, host uh, your family members. Well, this is recommended in the Sharia. You can have all. A believer enjoys everything for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at the same time, you pray on time, you pay charity, you fast Ramadan, you abide by everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam order you to abide by. And you enjoy your life. A lot of people think that Muslims lack the pleasure of this dunya. But we don't lack. Actually, it is, uh, it is those people who reject Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who lack the pleasure and tranquility of this life. Because we have the combination of both of them. And I hope that those of us who didn't get any of the luxuries of this life, do not live actually in an anxiety pursuing them. Because this is another, another agony. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't decree for you uh, any of the luxuries of this life, don't live while thinking of these luxuries. Think of what you have and enjoy it. This is why uh, who is better, a poor person or a rich person? There's a huge discussion in Islam. And there's a huge discussion also when the Prophet وسلم, said, I seek refuge with Allah from poverty, from faqr. A'udhu bika min al-faqr. Faqr is poverty as it could be translated, and it's a very common meaning of it. But Imam Nawawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, other scholars, like Imam Ghazali, for him, said what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam meant here is not poverty, is insufficiency. Faqr here is insufficiency, <coughs> not having enough. You could be a multi-billionaire and faqir, poor, because you want more. <coughs> And you could be the wealthiest person on the face of the earth, even with one loaf of bread, nothing else. It's about faqr and ghina. Poverty and richness is about sufficiency and insufficiency. Whether you feel you've got sufficient, sufficient uh, or enough, and you're happy with it, or not. This is why poor people sometimes suffer more than wealthy people, and wealthy people suffer more than uh, poor people. It, it is all about 
uh, being connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you look at other people's wealth, you are as a poor person worse than the wealthiest people. As a wealthy person, when you fear losing what you have, you are worse than a poor person. So from that angle, we, we understand how in Islam we look at... Uh, I don't want you to, to be attached to the luxuries of this life. We have to be attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, we should set goals in front of us. And the best goals we, should, we set in front of us are those which help us in our journey in this life. To reach Akhirah safely and move to Al-Jannah, inshallah. When you have a goal, then you work for it, you struggle for it. And you won't understand the importance of the goal unless you suffer for it, unless you, you have some uh, uh, agony in getting it. Because people inherit money, and they lose it very quickly, right? Because they never get tired in earning it. So the same, we don't want you to feel that, well, I have a goal and uh, it's very easy for me. No, if you have a, a goal and that is easy for you, as life is easy in Scandinavia here, for example, for many people, then set a harder goal, a tougher goal. And often, people it choose the easiest way for them. And for those who choose the easiest way, I tell you, choose a harder way for you, in order to discipline yourself. For example, usually wealthy people don't like praying at night. They think they can reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by just giving some of their money. And they can buy a jannah with some of their money. Their treatment, the remedy is a night prayer. They have to get up at night and pray. Because it is against their own desire. It's very easy to pay. But Islam is about struggle, self-struggle. You have to struggle against your whims. The same also for you. If you feel that, well, you are so intelligent and you can get the highest degree in medicine or in math or in biology, I tell you to go and memorize the Qur'an Kareem. Show me your excellence in the memorization of the Qur'an Kareem. For example, you have to set a goal for yourself and a goal that is really hard to get so that you feel the uh, pleasure of struggling. You know, when we were little kids, we used to hold a book and start memorizing dialectic poems, the Qur'an Kareem, of course, some hadith. We used to repeat and repeat and repeat, it's like and then we forget. And then repeat again and again and again. We struggled a lot until we memorized the thousands of lines of poetry and a lot of texts. Now we feel the pleasure of it. We felt at the time, probably, you know, that we had to do it. We didn't know really why. We had to do it. We know that this is the way to become a scholar, this is the way to become a learned person. So we did it. Uh, but it took us a lot of struggle. A lot of struggle. It, it's not something easy. There's a difference uh, between being a recipient and between uh, and uh, be and struggling to get something. And this is uh, I'm going to draw on uh, the sources of knowledge in Islam. There's a huge difference between holding a book to read and watching TV. People now turn to watch TV. They find it much easier. When you watch TV, you're not choosing what you want. Although it looks like you're choosing between channels, but you have, it's like a prisoner. You have 10 meals offered. You can't get anything more. But when reading a book, you're making the effort. You're not the recipient. You're the one who is struggling in order to get knowledge. You read a page, you don't understand it. You go back and read it again. A book recommended to you. It uh, complements part of your knowledge. For example, every one of us should read a book on, uh, let's say, uh, uh, essentials in our life, on uh, basics uh, in emergency situations. Uh, every one of us should have knowledge about, uh, let's say, uh, history, Islamic history. We should read about the Umayyads, the Abbasids, uh, to, to know what happened in Islamic history, about the Crusades. In this country, you should read a little bit about the history of this country. You know, this is part of knowledge, probably, depending on the priorities. The wajib is, of course, to start with uh, reading about your financial transactions, halal or haram, learn your deen, basics, learn akhlaq, ethics, about the Prophet sallallahu So you pick up what you need and read it. You are making the efforts here. 
And this is very important. When you make the efforts, then uh, finishing uh, a page or in the evening, you feel a difference. And this feeling uh, gives you a lot of pleasure, a lot of self-contentment, happiness. But well, I made something different today. Can you feel that you're different every day, every morning? You should feel different. Business people usually should, should feel different in their income. Because they say, last, well, last day, I, yesterday I earned more, I, my sales, my balance is more, and so on, so on. So they get happy. People who study, they get happy. We finished uh, our exams yesterday. I attended the lecture yesterday when I learned a new law in physics. I didn't really, I wasn't aware of something like that. For us, you know, uh, when we read Fiqh, when we read Tafsir, sometimes I read a book of Tafsir, I come across a verse of the Quran, I jump and dance and say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, in ecstasy because of learning one of the miracles you know, or revealing one of the secrets of the verses of the Qur'an or learning about one hadith or one uh, uh, line of poetry sometimes or it gives you a lot of pleasure that you achieve that it gives you a motive now to do more. This is a protection from laziness. Laziness comes from where you have no goal. Well, I have done everything. There's nothing more. To tell you the truth, people in this country are lazy. Why? I'm talking about people here who are like clerks, people who work in uh, administrations, in companies, uh, ITs, because there is no productivity. And by productivity, I mean here intellectual productivity. If you worked, if you studied IT, and graduated, and got a job, and in 10 or 15 years, you didn't make any improvement in your skills, you didn't do an extra course, then you're like a machine. You are like a machine. You are a lazy person. You're going in the morning to your job, coming back in the evening, in a number of years, then get rid of you. And then hire a new graduate with better skills. You lose, you lose your job because you had no aspiration. You didn't put a goal. The goal you put is wrong. You put a goal to graduate and get a job. Well, in 15 years, if you're living only to eat and earn some money and breathe, have some children without any other goal, of course, I'm talking about you know, people in this country, we add to that that we pray five times a day, alhamdulillah, and we do. But what else? 15 years of, of this life, you didn't serve the humanity, you didn't serve your community, you didn't increase in knowledge, you're working like a machine, you're a lazy person. Well, I remember, and I know stories of, of people who studied so hard and didn't stop at one minute in their life. And this is the beauty of, of studying the classical way. Now they call me a scholar, they, they describe me as a scholar, but to be honest, I'm a seeker of knowledge, like you. When I go home, I pick up a book, I travel, I carry with me a book that I need in an area which I need to deepen my knowledge in and read. I continue my studies, my investigations, my readings to widen my knowledge or my scope of knowledge in one area, in one subject. We don't stop. This is why in Islam we never had the system of four years in university or 12 years in schools and then uh, postgraduate. Uh, two years master's, two years PhD, we never had this. A student would accompany the teacher or the teachers for 20 years, for 10 years, 15 years, as much as he needs to study. And then he'll go on after getting ijazah if he needs to go back to his land in order to be an imam or a teacher, he'll continue. And most of the diseases of this ummah came from imams who didn't further their studies. They studied Ibadat and a little bit of Mu'amalat and some Nikah and Talaq and went back to their homes and became Imams without any motive to read more or study more. After studying with my father for many years, my father told me, I have given you the keys to knowledge. The keys to knowledge, not knowledge itself. And I have studied with him approximately 500 works, episodes, volumes, part of volumes, didactic poems, and so on. And he wanted me to know that 
This is not knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses all of humanity by saying, وَمَا أُوْتِيْتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا You are not given of knowledge but very little. Very little you are given of knowledge. So why should you be lazy and be happy what you are? You are a doctor? Get another specialty. Take a year or two. You are an engineer? Take an extra course? Take another language? For example, develop an extra skill? Take another course? It doesn't cost you much when you are young, you are healthy, you have intelligence, you can do it and you can develop your skills. Muslims should be at top of this world. One of my students in, uh, in the UK asked me, he is a physician, when shall I become a wali? I said, you want to become a top in your deen? until you become a top in your dunya. When you become top in your profession, then the door for you will be open to become a wali. Because wilaya will not be given to dumb people. A saint and a stupid person, it doesn't work together. A wali and a lazy person doesn't work together. A wali has to have a himma that moves mountains. A man of Allah has to have a human to move mountains. It doesn't work together. Combination is wrong. So you need to be suc successful in this life. You need to struggle. For example, when you forget to uh, brush your teeth in the morning, it's a sign that you may forget to read your word in the morning. You tell me how this is related to this. It's a mentality. Because laziness is a disease that could affect your deen or your dunya. Both of them. When you neglect going to school because you're lazy, you will neglect going to jama'ah in the masjid because you're lazy. This is why the ummah now is so much backward. We're doing nothing. We have the best resources in the world. Only one country could feed the whole world. There are studies about this. Go and read. Sudan alone could feed the whole world if planted wheat or barley. This is against people who talk about uh, controlling uh, pregnancy, conception. Rate, yeah. People who talk about birth rate and controlling birth rate, there are uh, several uh, facts could defeat and challenge this theory. One of them is by calculation. If one country like Sudan, Sudan has a very fertile soil, if it is well invested in agriculture and well farmed, it could feed the earth. Look at how people are lazy, they are not investing their own country. The same we talk about Syria, I'm from Syria, we talk about Pakistan, we talk about every uh, country in the Islamic world, we're not doing enough. We could do much more. Small countries around the world like South Korea or Taiwan or here Norway or Sweden or why do you get most of the, the winners of the Nobel Prize in Physics from Chalmers University in uh, Gothenburg. Because they study hard. Not because their level of intelligence, their level of IQ is better than us. No. You'll find a lot of us with higher IQ. Allah didn't discriminate in creating people. Allah created it with justice. When our ancestors produced Ibn Sina, Ibn Zuhr, Abu Bakr al-Razi, Imam Ghazali, and these great scholars, it means we can produce more. It's the same genes are within us. The same genes are still in the Islamic world, within us. Why are we not producing any of these great scientists and scholars? Because we're lazy. Our ancestors weren't lazy. When we read, I mentioned in some of my lectures, when I commented on uh, on the will and the advice
advice which Imam Abu Farash ibn Jawzi gave to his son. I described the life of Abu Farash ibn Jawzi. He invested every minute of his life. When he received his guests, he prepared his papers and his pens. He would be speaking to his guests while cutting his pens and organizing his papers. He would invest every minute of his life. He produced hundreds of volumes of work. He lived approximately 90 years. One of the great scholars, Abu Farash Abu Rahman al Ali ibn Jawzi, Hanbalai scholar, Muhaddith, the 6th century of Israel. So, this is an example. We have met so many examples of people. The Quran teaches us to work hard. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, gave the message to Yahya alayhi salam in Rokki, Yahya, what did Allah say to him? Ya Yahya, khudhi al kitaba. Biquwa, or oh, Yahya, take the book strongly, firmly, take it with power. Now when I say to you, hold your book and study strongly, with power, with determination, take it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he described to us al Jannah and its beauties, what did he say? Wa fi dhalika fal yatanafasil mutanafisun. In that, that people who want to compete, let them compete. And yet, it means there's something precious in front of you, and you want to get it, you do more than the others to get more of it. It's like you have having wealth in front of you, so you start carrying as much as you could. You read in the Quran, Kareem, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلِكُلِّ وَجْهَةٌ هُوَ مُوَلِّيهَا فَاسْتَمِقُوا الْخَيْرَاتِ For everyone there is a direction Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets for. So compete for good. Compete for good. To pick it up first. فَاسْتَمِقُوا Come before the others to get the good. Learning is good. Studying is good. Working is good. Good for you. Good for your deen. Good for your dunya. Good for your family. Good for the society. And prayer is good, dhikr is good, recitation of the Qur'an is good, memorization of the Qur'an is good, studying the deen is good. How much are we doing of all of this? We lived in a time when our ancestors believed in, uh, there was no good in football, for example. There was no good in entertainment. So they always warned us from wasting our time. Now the modern culture is based on wasting our time. From TV, from football, from everything is based on entertainment. Entertainment became an industry, unfortunately. And we are part of it. But in the past, when we lived, I think I mentioned to you or in some other places, that I used to play a little bit of football for a few times after getting out of school, beside the school. And because of that, I used to be late, going home late. My father would be waiting for me. If he is in the mosque, if he was in the mosque, he wouldn't notice. Uh, but my mother wouldn't complain, wouldn't tell him or so. <laughs> you know the story always. <laughs> if he's at home, he would not get worried. If it is 10, 15 minutes, you know, first time you play a little bit because my father is waiting for me at home, so I have to, to rush and I can't lie here. So if he has guests, probably he wouldn't notice if I'm 10 minutes or so. But, you know, playing football is really good, it's nice. Yes. And for a kid, for a kid, you're enjoying it. So, uh, with classmates, uh, probably it took me half an hour once. So my father went out of home looking for me. He would get worried if my son is lost, his son is, uh, you know, in the hands of, uh, you know, uh, bad people or whatever. Or. So he went looking for me in the streets. Uh, he came, he didn't say one thing to I saw him from, actually, my classmates saw him from far away first. Here's your father, here's your father. So I came and he held his hand, uh, held my hand. And he didn't say one single word till we reached home, was angry. And said to me, what do you want to be? A scholar or a football player? I said, a scholar. He said, this is not the way. This is not the way. <laughs> very briefly, very, very concise words. You never stop a game, you never play a game, you never... And for me, it was the end. Because it's very embarrassing to have my father coming and, you know, the school and then holding uh, my hand and taking me. And 
conversing in front of the classmates and uh, and of course they have uh, he said for me something different. So but of course I mean you would let me play a little bit at home, even at home, and uh, my life wasn't rigid at that time because you need to get relaxed. In that relaxation as kids, we would used to have you know, some games, some some tool, toys, something to play with, various things, you know, as, as kids. He would he would avert when we uh, study for one hour, for example, then as kids we would play for 10, 15 minutes, he would uh, he would be noticing, but make himself not noticing. If we went on and on playing, he would get out of his room and say, back to your book, hold your book again. So he taught us how to hold the book for three hours, for four hours, for five hours without moving. Can you do it? Hold the book, sit in a chair or on the floor, hold the book and read for five hours, not moving because you're so engrossed in it. You're taken by it. You don't want to, say, oh, because you have to. Either way, uh, either way. Can you do it? Can you hold your subha? I was a little kid. He used to ask me to do awrad that were awrad of the great awliya. Maybe the barakah of all what I have now is because of this awrad I used to do when I was a little kid. Because I, I, I never have time now to do as much as when I'm busy with people, unless I travel, usually for you know, in a flight for five, six hours sometimes. If I continue my al my awrad, no one disturbs me. But usually when I'm around people and family, it's difficult to get five hours continually uh, doing a work. He used to let, let me sit, order me to sit and hold my subha for five hours, for six hours, to do the dhikr without moving. Why? To have this discipline. To know that we have to struggle, to get rid of laziness. So, do you have this himma? This is a hadith, but it's not a hadith. Attributed to Sayyidina Ali of Yahweh Ta'ala and sometimes to Sayyidina Al Bakr Siddiq. It is in the words of Sayyidina Ali of Yahweh Ta'ala. Ulul Himmati min al Iman. It's a piece of wisdom, say. Ulul Himmati min al Iman. To have high aspirations is part of your Iman. Don't be what you are. Be what your best people, best friends want you to be. Be what Allah wants you to be. Be what the Prophet wants you to be. Don't accept your failure. Say, I failed in studies. No one can fail uh, in, in, one, in all areas. You can fail in one area just because of circumstances or because of difficulties, but you can succeed in another area. Our intelligence is lost, unfortunately. I tell you why, where it is lost. As Ummah now, Arabs and Muslims. Where do we lose our intelligence? In finding all traps, like uh, immigrants in the West here, where, what do they think? Instead of thinking of studying and working hard to reach the top in this society, they lose their intelligence in thinking how to earn money in the black market, for example. How to go around the law, you find people separating from their wives or their husbands in order to get two homes and get more money from the government. They, they think uh, in a cunning way, they use their intelligence in, uh, in the wrong way. Why don't you think that, well, okay, I don't want to, to, to eat uh, uh, everything, I will save some, some money and go and attend the course and study a language. Because it serves, when you study a language, you can teach in that language, you can speak the Muda'wah. I will need to memorize the Quran, okay, I will go to the masjid, find the Imam and review with him one page every day of the Quran. Unless you know the importance of it, this is one important aspect, you know the importance of uh, uh, promoting yourself or getting something better, it serves you, it serves the community, it improves your social status, it improves your position before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it gives you more respect from people, it earns you sometimes a lot of times more money. Have high himma. I'm starting from these practical things because I want you to have Himma, what is your Himma in the Akhirah? Jannah? Have Himma in the dwell of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even amongst the awliya, in our Sufi struggle, in our religious struggle to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our journey, we have several goals. A lot of people tell you, well, I, all I want is a Jannah. And there is a song uh, about this. Al Jannah, Dalika Aqsa Ma Atamanna. What does it say in the beginning? 
Al-Jannah is the utmost of what I wish for. This is what the song says. I change the song. I tell people to sing. This is the least of what I look for. Al-Jannah is the least of what I look for. There's more. Looking at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The greatest pleasure. The beatific, beatific vision. وَجُوهٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ نَاضِرًا إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَا نَاضِرًا Ridwan, having Allah happy with you, pleased with you. Allah is pleased with you. Allah says in the Quran, this is greater than anything else. وَرِدْوَانٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرٌ Ridwan from Allah is greater than anything else. When you sit for a Jannah, it's enough for you to avoid haram, to do all your obligations, and to live as an ordinary Muslim. It's enough for you for a Jannah. But when you set a goal with one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or looking at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in al Qiyamah, then you have to do a dhikr in the morning and in the evening, you have to do much more struggle, you have to learn the deen, you have to serve. Much more you struggle. Why? The first goal is not enough. For people who put a Jannah, it's not enough for you to put a Jannah. I tell you why. Because there are obstacles on the way. And most of the obstacles are hidden and subtle and you're unaware of them. So you set the goal without a murshid, without a teacher, without uh, a company, a good company, then you will be lost. And the way to Al-Jannah will be heading east and you will be heading west. And you're unaware of it. This is why you have always, the higher your goal is, more your struggle is, and your achievement sometimes goes uh, in percentage, in proportion to your struggle, right? If you want to earn a, a million uh, krona, let's say a year, you struggle by, depending on your struggle and your ability and everything you have, you might earn 20%, 30% of, of uh, what you aim at. The same also in our ibadah and ta'a, especially with women around us, temptations, dunya, negligence, TV, a lot of things around us. You set a goal agenda, you find yourself probably at the door of agenda outside. This is why when you set your goal as seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay, if you don't get it, you get a jannah at least. Why? <laughs> this is why you have to have high himma in order to get rid of this laziness. There's a motive in your life that should uh, drive you to do something better. You go home now, don't just sit and say, okay, you, you quarrel with your wife. Or uh, women quarrel with their husbands, for example. Or your children do not obey you. You can solve the problem. Don't take it just as a granted, this is my fate. You can improve yourself. Take a pocket of flowers to your wife. For example, on the way home, tell her I love these flowers for you. She'll exchange it with a smile and she'll be very happy. And then you start working out your relationship with your wife a little bit. Your children, the same, try to do something. If you do not struggle, if you do not have, have a motive to improve yourself, you will never find your way to a Jannah. You will never succeed in your deen. We need to struggle. This is what our Quran Karim speaks about, about the reality of things. When Allah ordered us taqwa, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqu allaha haqqa tuqati Reality of taqwa When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us to do jihad wa jahidu fi allahi haqqa jihad True jihad Get the realities of things The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is of course a model for us And he warned us with the issue of kasal Laziness He specifically in the sound hadith in sahih al-imam muslim on the authority of Sayyidina Anas radiallahu ta'ala an, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sought refuge with Allah from laziness. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-ajz wal kasal from failure and from laziness. Oh Allah, I seek refuge with you from failure and from laziness. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-ajz wal kasal wa'udhu bika min al-jubni wal-bukhl from stinginess and from being coward. The Prophet sought refuge from Allah to learn, to teach us, to show us the way. 
Failure. Don't lay the blame in your failure on others. It's a very common now practice amongst people to lay the blame in their business on circumstances when they fail. To lay the blame on failure with their marital relationship on black magic. <laughs> to lay the blame on the, uh, on the, for their failure in school on teachers, for example. And on and on and on. When you look at it, it's you. It's you who caused the failure. You failed. You weren't up to it. You couldn't do it. Then it's not again. The problem is, when you lay the blame on others, this is what they say. To err is a human. To lay the blame on, to blame someone else on it is politics. <laughs> <laughs> this is what they say in the West here. The moment you lay the blame on someone else, you're never going to succeed. Because you're not finding the cause of, of your failure. You're totally in the wrong direction. I received once one of my friends. He came with the, one of his friends, a man in his 60s, complaining that his marriage failed. Well, I could understand if someone just got married and comes to me and says, you know, his marriage is failing. I understand this, but after 30 years of getting married, someone coming say, saying his marriage failed is very strange. I said to him, what's happening? Tell me the story. He had been married for 30 years or so. Explain. He said he believes, strongly believes there is black magic done to him to ruin his marriage, to destroy his marriage. I talked to him, he's a lay person. He would never be convinced otherwise. Tell me what's the story. He, have few, he has few, few children. It looked like his children were, are married and were living with him and his wife in the same home. So his grandchildren were keeping him busy. He gets busy with his grandchildren, plays with them, takes care of them. So he's busy most of the time. The last of his sons moved out. So what is remaining in the house now is he and his wife. So all of a sudden now, he discovered all deficiencies and ugliness in his wife. <laughs> because he has to look at her now 24 hours. <laughs> he started interfering because he's now, he has free time. So he goes to the kitchen, why this is here, why this is here, why this is here. Well, this is, how, this is how I've been doing it for many years, now you're complaining. Well, he didn't see it because he was busy with his grandchildren. Now he has free time. So I discovered that's the problem. There was no black magic. There was no black magic at all. That's the problem. But to be honest, to convince him that when there's no black magic, if I say that there's no black magic, he'll go to another shape. And they will suck his money. And they will tell him, well, we will try to solve it for you. And they will take all his wealth. I said to him, I'll make dua for you. And so the black magic will be gone. I want from you some, something to help me. You go home. Uh, now, flowers is not a custom in, uh, in our country, so in the Islamic world, you know, I'll take, take some fruits and find some good gift for your wife, take it uh, to her, and have one of your children visiting you once, one day a week. So that around the week, his children, his children will come and visit him, daughters and sons, with their children. So they will be with the, the, the home will be full of you know, life and activities, grandchildren are running, so they will keep uh, sort of being distracted from his wife and from interfering. And, and he sent a message to, to my friend telling him, this Sheikh is a great philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> he solved all my problems. <laughs> he said. Now, it doesn't take a Sheikh to do this. It takes you just with a little bit of reflection, a little bit of Thinking, I need to improve myself, I need to improve my life, I need to increase my income, I need to increase my knowledge, I need to, to be a better, better person, I need to be, be a better servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I need to know Allah more, I need to honor Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more, I need Rasulullah to be happier with me, I need, I need... Then you lose the struggle and struggle and struggle. This is why we have to seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from laziness as the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala told us because laziness uh, could not only 
prevent you from raising to prayer, it could uh, prevent you from reaching a Jannah. It, not, uh, it wouldn't only prevent you from earning your rizal, it would prevent you from being a successful person in this life. We need the Ummah to get up, to rise up to the challenges we are facing now. And unless every individual treats this disease, we won't be able. Don't say that the Ummah is failing and I'm not part of it. We are part of it and every one of us is responsible for the failure of the Ummah. Because every one of you could be a scientist, could be a rich person who could really contribute to Islamic activities. Every one of you could be probably a scholar. Every one of you could be uh, anything, anything useful in the society. Some are, of course, already in media. Everyone, inshallah, could, could be. And even, even if you are a true man of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah leaves calamity, removes calamity because of you. You know, these great men of Allah. A land is sacred as much as there is there are awliya on it. So people who traveled here, did you bring with you awliya? When you migrated here, did you think about it? People who migrated here never thought we need imams, we need scholars of fiqh, we need scholars, theologians, we need so, we need so. But you need more than anything else awliya amongst you. So if you can't be a doctor, if you can't be an engineer, if you can't be a writer, if you can't be a businessman, be a man of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by your birth, Allah removes calamities from the people around you. When a way lives in an area, the whole area will be, will be full of light. One person was telling me in, uh, in uh, Moldova, I was speaking to a brother in Moldova, right? Moldova, previous Russian Republic, close, close by here. So anyway, I was phoning a brother from Syria there, and he was telling me a, 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 a true brother, really a man of Allah. He's in our tariqah, and he's in his uh, probably 60s, close to 60s, and he's been spending all his life in dhikr. And he's a successful man, mashallah, he has a few professions. So he was talking to me on the phone, telling me you know, how life is there. He said the area where he is married to a, to a woman from that country, he said, when, when I moved there, and lived, the area was very bad around. And there used to be a lot of bad people. And, lot. and now the people in that area uh, come to him and thank him by living in this area you brought to us tranquility. You brought to us peace. Because the moment he lived there, everything bad in that area disappeared. And noise disappeared. And the people of that area feel tranquility and they came and thanked him for that, some of them. Why? Because this is a uh, man of Allah. I, I, we, we, we don't judge what we see by the signs, by the actions of people. This is a man who spent his life in dhikr, in the company of the ulama. <coughs> when there, darkness will be removed, will be kicked away, light will be brought, noise will go away, tranquility will be replaced, will uh, replace it. So the same also with you. If you fail in any other area, you can't fail to be a, a man of Allah. All it takes in you just some, some himma to hold your subha and do dhikr, to hold the Quran and recite Quran, to attend prayer in the masjid. It doesn't take you much. Just good company of the good people. May Allah protect us from laziness. And may Allah protect us from failure. May Allah open the way to us and to the Muslim ummah to be on top uh, of this world, in power, in civilization, in science. May Allah combine to us deen and dunya and akhirah and make us good servants of him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.